My name is Dan McBride, and I'm the president of the University of Virginia chapter of the Federal Society. Thank you for coming here for the 35th Annual National Student Symposium. For those of you who weren't here last night, I just want to stress the importance of having your name tag with you, especially if you're, if you're coming to the banquet tonight, you're going to need your name tag to get in, or it's going to cause a mess. So please bring your name tag. Uh, our first panel is about to start, and I'm going to call up Robert Smith, who's uh, co-chair of our 1L committee here at the law school, and he's going to introduce our moderator. Robert? Thank you, Dan. As Dan said, we begin this morning with our panel on the family. My name is Robert Smith, and I'm pleased to introduce Judge Randolph, who will be moderating the panel. Judge Arthur Raymond Randolph was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit by President George H.W. Bush in 1990. He received his bachelor's degree from Drexel University and his J.D. from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, summa cum laude. From 1969 to 1970, he served as law clerk to Judge Henry J. Friendly of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Judge Randolph was an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States from 1970 to 1973 and Deputy Solic Solicitor General from 1975 to 1977. Early in his career, he served as Special Counsel to the House Ethics Committee and Special Assistant Attorney General for the states of Montana, New Mexico, and Utah. From 1971 until his appointment to the D.C. Circuit, Judge Randolph argued 23 times before the United States Supreme Court, winning 20 of his cases. He has taught civil procedure and injunctions at the G Georgetown University Law Center and was a distinguished adjunct professor of law at the George Mason University School of Law, where for many years he taught First Amendment law. From 1993 to 1995, Judge Randolph was a member of the Committee on Codes of Conduct of the Judicial Conference of the United States. And from 1995 to 1998, he served as the committee's chairman. Judge Randolph is a mem member of the Board of Visitors at the Drexel University Law School and serves on the Judicial Advisory Board at the George Mason Law and Economic Center. Please welcome him. Thanks. Well, welcome. Uh, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about the Federalist Society is their uncanny ability to choose topics that are uh, in the news of great concern, and they do this so far ahead of time, and, and this conference is, is no exception. And I was thinking about it. Um, my wife and I are blessed with uh, four grandsons. Uh, and the three of them live in northern New Jersey uh, with our son and daughter-in-law and, and their uh, golden retriever in a lovely town outside of my son works in Manhattan. Um, Hunter, the oldest, is six years old. And we gave a Christmas present to Hunter. We went up there, my wife and I, and visited uh, last Christmas. And, and it's a very clever device. It's called uh, Compose Yourself. And it enables somebody, even a child, uh, to compose classical music and then have an orchestra play back the music on your iPad or your iPhone. Really a remarkable invention by a cellist um, and, a compo and a composer himself. So using the device, we opened it up and, and Hunter uh, invented a short piece of music. And he was very pleased when it was pay played back on the iPad. As a matter of fact, he was kind of swooning, uh, listening to his own music. And so th the device allows you to save uh, the music by naming it. And so I asked Hunter, you know, what he wanted to call his, his work. And without a moment's hesitation, our six-year-old said, happy life. And I share this personal account with you because it contrasts so starkly with the experience of many of the children I have been reading about in Robert Putnam's uh, book, Our Kids, and in the writings of several of our uh, panelists here today. As Professor Putnam put it, the structure of the American family suddenly collapsed in the 1970s. Premarital sex lost its stigma almost overnight. Shotgun marriages, how many of you know what a shotgun marriage even is? 
Uh, okay, a shotgun marriage is sharply diminished and then virtually disappeared and divorce became epidemic and the number of kids living in single parent homes began a long steady ascent. Why this has happened and what if anything can be done about it is an important part of today's discussion. And so without further ado, I will introduce the panelists in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Ms. Kay Heimowitz is the William E. Simon Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributor, contributing editor of City Journal. She writes on childhood, on family issues, on poverty, and on cultural change in America. Ms. Heimowitz has participated at many conferences. She sits on the board of respected journals such as National Affairs and the Future of Children and she's been interviewed on numerous radio and TV programs. Ms. Heimowitz holds a BA in literature from Brandeis and an MA in English literature from Columbia University. Among her books are Marriage and Caste in America, Separate and Unequal Families in a Postmarital Age. Our next speaker will be Professor Bradford Wilcox. He's director of the National Marriage Project here at the University of Virginia and an associate professor of sociology. He is also a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia and earned his PhD at Princeton. Among his many writings, Professor Wilcox is co-author of Gender and Parenthood, Biological and Social Scientific Perspectives. His research has focused on marriage, on fatherhood, and on cohabitation especially on the ways that family structure, civil society, society, and culture influence the quality and stability of family life in America and around the globe. Professor uh, Wilcox teaches courses here in statistics, family, and religion. Professor Mary Ann Case uh, teaches at the University of Chicago Law School. She's a graduate of Yale College and of Harvard Law School. And before going to Chicago, she was a law professor here at the University of Virginia and was a visiting law professor at NYU and Columbia. Among the subjects Professor Case has taught are constitutional law, marriage and family law, and religious freedom. She is the author of dozens of articles in law reviews and books. As a matter of fact, I told Professor Case before we came out that if I started reading off all her writings in various journals, it would take the, the entire hour and 45 minutes. Uh, Robert Woodson is the founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. The center's purpose is to strengthen neighborhood-based organizations seeking to serve their communities. The center has provided training and technical assistance to more than 2,600 leaders of community-based groups in 39 states. Among other awards, Mr. Woodson has received the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Genius Fellowship and the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation Prize, as well as the Presidential Citizens Medal. He's the author of Youth Crime and Urban Policy, A View from the Inner City, the book On the Road to Economic Freedom and Agenda for Black Progress, and, and many others. And with that, uh, Kay, will you start us off? Good morning, everybody. I. Um was pleased to see that in a conference um, devoted to the issue of poverty, you were beginning with the issue of family, uh, because uh, from my vantage point, uh, the two are deeply connected, um, and um, no, there's really no way to really get a, a total picture of a poverty in America today without understanding both the breakdown of the family and the fatherlessness that almost inevitably follows. Um, so uh, let me start by just giving you, um, I think I have about seven bullet, quick bullet points with some data to give you a sense of uh, where we're at on the family and poverty front. Um, you probably have heard something like this before, about 40% of American children are born to unmarried mothers uh, today. Um, and about 40% of the, the marriages that do take place um, uh, end in divorce. Um, that's number one. Number two uh, bullet point um, is that the single mother households are six times more likely to be poor than married couple households. 
Now, um, the simplest reason for that, uh, but not by any means the complete reason, uh, is that the uh, single uh, parent family is more likely to just have one income, two parent families these days, uh, two incomes. But um, I think we'll see it's a, there's a lot more at stake than that. Um, about 20% of children and families making under $15,000 uh, a year are uh, in two-parent families. That is uh, um, only 20%. Um, only uh, the rest are all from single-parent families. Um, uh, and I suspect, although I, I haven't uh, seen the data on this, I suspect among that 20%, a lot of them are recent immigrants. Of the uh, uh, children of uh, um, parents who are recent immigrants, um, thus explaining their poverty. Um, to get to the next point, um, if these these numbers that I'm talking about actually affect the um, statistics that we hear all the time about our high poverty rate, uh, about every year around September the. Um, Census Bureau releases the new poverty numbers and people rush to speculate about its uh, meaning. Um, and it remains um, stubbornly high, uh, as most of you uh, probably know. So um, if we, if we uh, tinker with that data a little bit, if, if, and we imagine a world where non uh, the um, uh, non-marital birth rate were as low today as it was in, uh, let's say, 30 years ago, uh, our f poverty rates would be far lower. Um, Isabel Sawhill and Adam Thomas, um, have, uh, uh, both of the Brooklyn, Brookings Institute at the time, um, they estimate that child poverty rate would have been at least uh, cut by a third uh, had marriage rates remained as they were in 1980. So uh, a lot of what we're hearing then is an, is an artifact, not all of it by any means, but a lot of it is an artifact of uh, family breakdown. Um, uh, Brad uh, Wilcox sitting next to me and uh, Robert Lehrman did a study recently, which uh, for those of you who are interested in this subject, of the relationship between income, poverty, and uh, family, I, you would be well advised to look at it. It's called For Richer or Poorer. And they found that um, it's 78% of families with children were married couple families in 1980, as recently as 1980. Uh, by 2012, that was 66%. Now, had, though, uh, had the number remained 78%, that is, had the uh, number, the percentage of uh, families who were from married couple families remained at 78%, uh, overall median income would have risen 22% rather than the 14% that it actually had. And by the way, this controls for all of the variables that uh, you might consider uh, to be impacting these numbers. It controls for race, it controls for education, uh, and uh, Hispanic descent. Uh, bullet point number five, it is true that married couples are different before they get married. So we can't just say very simply, uh, you're gonna be rich if you get married. Um, it's not like that. They are a self-selected group. Uh, married couples are far more likely to be college educated. There is um, a uh, marriage gap, uh, as I call it, that has uh, been um, emerging and is now very much part of our social geography. Uh, where um, college-educated young men and women marry before they have children and are less likely to divorce. I always joke that I seem to know all of those, uh, <laughs> all of those divorced college-educated people. But um, uh, they are, in fact, uh, despite, despite the evidence of, of my eyes and maybe yours, uh, they are, in fact, less likely to divorce than less educated uh, folks. So those children of those, of those families are having a much more stable um, uh, and uh, protective environment uh, than the children of, who are already disadvantaged by the fact that their parents are less educated and lower Income, so it's kind of a double or triple whammy. 
Um, you know, I think it's important to remember when we talk about um, the uh, fact that there are uh, college educated people and that is higher ed income people are, are more likely to be the ones who marry, uh, to remember that when we look at the outcomes for children in married couple families as opposed to single parent families, we are, uh, the, most of the research that's um, quoted is trying to control for income and um, uh, race and education and all of that. So my point being that even if you are a child growing up in, with poor parents, but if they are uh, stably married, your chances in life are much better, uh, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, I, I also want to emphasize this is something new. There's a there's an assumption out there that somehow poverty has always mean meant uh, that people don't marry, and that's just not true. So in uh, 1950, for instance, um, or even almost into 1960, uh, college-educated women did much what. Uh, women living in trailer parks were doing. They married before they had kids. And um, admittedly, there was a slight difference in those um, uh, numbers, but the expectation was that you uh, marry before you had kids. And the father, uh, as a result of that, was uh, closely, um, uh, at least legally, connected to the children in the, of that union. Um, so I mentioned before that the children of married parents are, are going to are more likely to do better in life, even if they are poor. So, for instance, uh, if we look at the mobility of poor children, um, if their parents are married, uh, they have a 17% um, chance of staying poor. That number is 50% for kids in single parent families. So that's quite different. Um, and in fact, the kids who are poor, uh, who uh, grow up with, a married, uh, with married parents, have an equal chance of reaching the uh, highest quintiles as they do of staying poor. Uh, the numbers are completely different for children growing up in single parent families, and um, they have virtually no chance, um, at least statistically, of making it to the top two quintiles. Um, you know, uh, one of the expectations has been all along since we've seen this change in marriage habits is that, uh, well, people would still continue to co-parent, fathers would remain involved with their children. Um, that has, um, sometimes happen, but it's, uh, it's not nearly what you might expect. Uh, the, after a breakup, particularly in, um, among non unmarried couples, uh, fathers um, are as likely to disappear more or less completely as they are to remain uh, involved, uh, closely involved with their children. So uh, that's why I say that the fatherlessness uh, seems to be almost an inevitable result of this uh, marriage breakdown. Uh, and then finally, the uh, point that, you, that lies underneath of all this and why we need to be concerned uh, about these trends is that all of the data suggests that kids who uh, grow up with um, married, in, in a married couple family are uh, more likely to succeed in life on a number of uh, measures. They are going to do better in school. They're more likely to graduate from school. They're more likely to go to college uh, and complete college. They are less uh, prone to emotional problems. They are less likely to have um, or, uh, become young parents, them, single parents themselves. Uh, though, you know, I'm, I'm very quickly going over decades and decades of research on this. Now, the implications of this breakdown that I'm describing are profound for both the size of our government and our legal system. And for those with libertarian sympathies, uh, you should be uh, very alarmed. The family courts are flooded with cases related to custody and other family disruption. Uh, there is uh, also, of course, an expanded infrastructure uh, you know, government infrastructure to support uh, a growing and I think more or less permanent class of poor and near poor. 
Uh, in New York, where uh, I live, uh, you have not only a welfare, though it's a, a temporary these days, but we also have, of course, food stamps, uh, we have Medicaid, we have uh, uh, housing subsidies, childcare subsidies, um, SSI for many, many uh, of uh, these families, um, special ed classes, uh, if you go to special ed classes, they are uh, dominated by the sons in particular uh, of, uh, of single parent families. Um, and uh, in addition, our, uh, you, our juvenile courts uh, are filled also with the uh, problems uh, with the problems that the, uh, follow on the lack of fathers and the uh, lack of stability in the lives of many poor children. Um, Judge Leah Sears, who's a former Chief Justice of Georgia Supreme Court, uh, wrote about this uh, some years ago. She was already noticing in 2006 that the percentage of domestic relations cases has risen sharply. They now account, she wrote at the time, for 65% of all cases in Georgia at the superior court level. Um, more, there's more than 14,000 children in the care of the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services, nearly 24,000 youth in the youth detention center, and I could go on and go through every state and show you uh, how, just how high these uh, numbers are. I would add one more thing, which is that uh, the vast majority of our prisoners, and I'm not talking, so I'm not talking about the uh, people in jail for uh, drug for uh, drug offenses, but for violent offenses, the vast majority of them come from single parent homes. This is not, I don't mean to say there's a easy cause and effect here, but the uh, connection is profound and uh, meaningful in my view. Um, the judges are now in a position, and this is even true for people who are less, uh, who, are, who have more money than the, the population we've been talking about, the judges are now in the business of making decisions about very personal arrangement, domestic arrangements, where children should live, what school he or she should go to, whether the child should celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah, whether uh, they should study piano or violin. Uh, really, I'm not joking. If you talk to judges who are dealing with these uh, problems, these are the kind of daily issues that are, are uh, coming up. Uh, and then, of course, there is the huge, as Bernie Sanders would say, child enforcement system, although maybe he, or child support enforcement system, although maybe he wouldn't talk about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, every, every state in the country has a Title IV-D agency. They are uh, busy establishing paternity, locating non-custodial parents, establishing and modifying orders, collecting and redistributing and distributing uh, uh, child support, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to end by just uh, quoting um, uh, my friend who I think is in the um, audience, Professor Amy Wax, who um, uh, alludes to a, a quote by Trotsky. That's a funny combination, but <laughs> um, uh, he said, um, uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Uh, and as Amy points out, uh, you may not be interested in family breakdown, but family breakdown is interested in you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here to speak to the Federal Society this morning, and I want to begin by talking about what's happening in the broader culture. And I think from Hollywood to the halls of academia, we're increasingly hearing the message that marriage doesn't matter. Children and families, goes to the new progressive line, need not enjoy the shelter and security of a married home to thrive. 
Take, for instance, Jennifer Aniston, who said, quote, women are realizing it more and more, you know, that they don't have to settle with a man just to have that child. Or in a book on maverick moms, which celebrates women who are raising boys without men, Cornell psychologist Peggy Drexler claimed that, quote, women possess the innate mom power that in itself is more than sufficient to raise fine sons. And this Pollyannist message has been taken up in the media as well. Last spring, for instance, Matthew Iglesias of Vox gave explicit voice to the idea that the decline of marriage isn't a problem for women, children, and the country as a whole. Of course, these messages have not been lost on today's young adults. In fact, a large minority of millennials believe that marriage is becoming obsolete and that a growing variety of family arrangements is a good thing, according to a recent Pew report. It's all of a piece with <clears throat> the increasingly laissez-faire character of family life that many young adults today find compelling. The only problem with the view articulated by the likes of Iglesias and Drexler, of course, is that it's pure applesauce, in the more words of Antonin Scalia. Because on average, men, women, and children are more likely to realize the American dream when marriage grounds adult intimacy in the ring of the next generation for reasons that I think that Kay did a good job of articulating. So this morning, I'm going to give you some highlights uh, from some new research that I've done with the economist Joe Price and Robert Lerman um, that underlines the connection between marriage and the economic health of the American states. And before I do that, I want to just acknowledge that I think the, uh, the point <coughs> that Kay was stressing to us at the beginning of the session, namely that as this particular quote from the Princeton Brookings Journal, The Future of Children, indicated in a recent issue, quote, reams of social science and medical research convincingly show that children who are raised by their married biological parents enjoy better physical, cognitive, and emotional outcomes on average than children who are raised in other circumstances. So we know more and more today that indiv individual kids are more likely to thrive when they're raised by their own married parents. But what we're less kind of, I think, attentive to is the way in which um, family structure has an impact on communities more generally. What my research with Bob Lerman and Joe Price indicates is that when families are stronger, so too is the economy, that we see high levels of state growth, we see state child poverty being uh, lower, we see state family median income being higher, and the sort of the health of the American dream itself, measured in terms of economic mobility, is uh, also stronger. So for instance, we see in states like New Mexico and Louisiana, very high levels of child poverty, in part because single parenthood is much more common in these states. By contrast, in states like North Dakota and New Hampshire, child poverty is comparatively rare, um, in part because there are many more two-parent families um, in these two states. Likewise, we see when it comes to the American dream, in this case, looking at the odds that a child who was raised at the 25th percentile in terms of family income will make it into the middle class. So the odds of, sort of again, realizing the American dream for poor kids is stronger in states like North Dakota and Utah, where the family is, is stronger. And it's weakest in states like South Carolina and North Carolina, uh, where the family is much weaker. So our research suggests, kind of looking at the picture as a whole, that the average state per capita GDP would be 4.2% higher if states enjoyed their 19 level, levels of married parenthood, the child poverty would be 70% lower, the family median income would be about 10% higher, and that the more general bottom line here is that our nation's economy would be in better shape if more families were headed by married parents. It's also important to note <coughs> when you look at this in a multivariate context, that the share of parents in a state who are married is a stronger predictor of economic mobility, child poverty, and median family income than are measures of uh, educational, racial, and age compositions of the states. So it's a pretty powerful factor um, in a multivariate context. Now I've spoken about the connection between strong families and strong hives. I want to speak very briefly about some of the mechanisms that we think may be operating here. And the first comes down to marriage and men. And are we on the same slide here with this? Is this marriage and men on the slide here? No. So 
So back in 1998, uh, George Akerlof was a Nobel Prize winning economist and the husband of our new Fed chair, Janet Yellen, wrote an interesting essay on marriage and men. And he said a number of things in that essay. And one of the things that he said in that essay was that, quote, men settle down when they get married. Now, the way he formulated that may seem anachronistic today in 2016, but sort of the fundamental truth of that assertion is still uh, correct. Because we know that even today, marriage uh, tends to make men work harder, to work more strategically, and to work more successfully. We know, for instance, that men who are married are less likely to be fired compared to comparable men who are single, and they're more likely, for instance, to find a second job when they're not happy with their first job before they quit that first job compared to their single peers who are much more likely to just quit that first job and then look for that second job. So it's just kind of an indication of the way in which marriage seems to engender a spirit of hard work and prudence on the part of men. In our own work, we find, for instance, that married men are much more likely to be in the labor force um, compared to their peers who are single um, and childless, as this slide here suggests to you uh, today. So we think part of the story here is that married men are more likely to be actively engaged in labor force compared to their peers, and so states that have more married men are more likely to benefit from that connection between marriage and men's labor force participation. A second point comes to the, the organization of the household. Married families are more likely to both have more money and to manage it more prudently. They're more likely to enjoy economies of scale, of course, to pool their income compared to, of course, cohabiting couples and single parent families. They save more um, and they get more support from their kin. So all these things tend to foster better economic outcomes for married families. And we can see here that African Americans, that Hispanics, that whites, less educated and more educated Americans enjoy higher family incomes when they're married um, compared to being unmarried. A third point comes to this issue of human capital. Um, and in today's marketplace, obviously, getting human capital is, is particularly important. So kids who come from intact families are more likely to graduate from high school and college, and they're more likely to be gainfully employed as young adults. And we see, for instance, at the state level, that states that have more married parent families are more likely to enjoy higher levels of high school graduation rates. And then finally, in terms of a fourth mechanism, this issue of public safety, which Kay Heimwitz touched upon, we see that when families are headed by married parents, their teenage boys, um, and then later on young men, are much less likely to commit crime, and they're less likely to end up in jail. So at the community level, when there are stronger families, government can spend less on public safety, businesses benefit from lower security costs, and we also see that safer neighborhoods are more likely to engender upward mobility on the part of poor boys. Um, so for all these reasons, when the family is stronger, um, you see more public safety and then in turn better economic outcomes down the road. And this next slide shows there is a strong connection between state violent crime rates and the share of parents um, who are married um, in a given state. So states that have low levels of married parenthood, uh, that's the five here on the screen in front of you, have much higher rates of violent crime than states that have more married parent families in the mix. So the bottom line here is that strong families deepen men's connections to the workforce, boost family income and assets, foster better educational and labor force outcomes for young adults, and also engender more public safety, all things that we think are foundations for prosperous states. So why are some states more likely to be flourishing when it comes to marriage and family life than other states? On the left, I think that the common view here is that it's about economics. Um, and we have Annie Lowry, who was in the New York Times, writing that from an economist's perspective, our collective allergy to matrimony might be a macroeconomic issue. In order to save marriage, we'd have to end poverty. And I think she has a point, but the problem with that view is that it doesn't really take into account sort of our nation's history over the course of the last century. As Bell Sahila Brookings has said, a purely economic theory falls short as an explanation of the dramatic transformation of family life in the United States in recent decades. And just one example of this, of course, is the Great Depression, when we experienced massive increases in poverty and unemployment, and we did not see an increase in family instability or in single parents. So there was something else, obviously, in the mix that was anchoring families um, in ways that 
uh, suggest that it's not just about money when it comes to understanding what's happening to our families. So in terms of the best and worst states, I give you a, a, a quick view of that right here. But we see when we look at sort of the states that are flourishing, um, we see some evidence for the social structural economic argument, states like Mississippi and Georgia, with low levels of education, median family income, are more likely to be struggling when it comes to strong families, and states with higher levels of education and median income for men are the least affected by the retreat from marriage, states like Minnesota and New Hampshire. But culture also matters. States with middling or even low levels of education, but a high degree of cultural conservatism, are some of the most resistant to the retreat from marriage, states like Idaho, South Dakota, and Utah. And indeed, this has led David Leonhardt, the New York Times, to observe that, quote, the respect, even reverence for the idea of marriage found in conservative communities may affect people's behavior and their attitudes. So the bottom line here is that our conclusion is that both structural and cultural factors explain why some states have proved to be the most successful in resisting the nationwide retreat from marriage. So that's why states as varied as New Hampshire and Minnesota and Idaho and Utah are doing comparatively well on the family front. So let me just conclude by offering some very brief comments on what might be done here, given the importance of the family on the legal and policy fronts to strengthen uh, marriage in America. And the first thing that I would say is that public policy should strive to do no harm um, to marriage when it comes to um, our state tax and transfer and federal tax and transfer policies. So today about one third of Americans receive means tested benefits. Uh, and unfortunately many of those benefits end up penalizing marriage. And that's important because the probability of marriage falls as the marriage penalty increases, as all that all have, um, have written. So we can, I think, look to reform our public transfer policies in ways that reduce or eliminate the marriage penalty that they engender. A second point is to think about, uh, this is really frankly a more longer term agenda given sort of the sensitivity that this issue tends to raise among uh, lawyers and state legislators, but we need to think about ways to sort of um, push forward divorce reform uh, because there's I think more and more empirical evidence that no-fault divorce reduced uh, investments in marriage and also was linked to the declines in the marriage rate. Um, as people, particularly men, became less confident um, in marriage as an institution and as a contract. So reforms for divorces involving kids might, for instance, mean pushing the move towards more true joint custody where you really do see in the wake of a divorce um, basically a 50-50 time split between um, spouses. Uh, secondly, thinking about uh, a more universal norm of a one-year waiting period for those divorces involving kids. And thirdly, doing parental education, including information about reconciliation, because a decent minority of people who are going through a divorce, we now have learned, have kind of a real degree of ambivalence about their divorce. And they kind of to see options uh, for reconciliation, they might pursue those. And so to do that in some kind of parental education process when couples are considering divorce. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to conclude here with the next slide by saying that given the central role that marriage plays in fostering growth, prosperity, and the American dream, uh, the nation, in my view, needs to renew the economic, the policy, the civic, and cultural foundations of marriage and family life for the 21st century. Um, and that would do a lot to address some of the issues that have been raised in this 2016 election. Thank you. So I am delighted to be uh, back here revisiting various aspects uh, of my past uh, and I hope moving forward with them. The, the first is a very personal one. My relationship to the topic poverty and equality in the family personally uh, is not really visible because class is one of the things we leave behind and uh, no longer uh, make visible. I am... Um, the product of a single parent family uh, growing up in poverty in the inner city. 
uh, Barack and Obama and I have more in common than that we both once taught law at the, uh, constitutional law at the University of Chicago. We have both come from the lowest quintile to the highest quintile in American society in the course of one generation in a single parent uh, family. Um, the second personal aspect uh, of uh, my being here is I'm delighted to be back at UVA, uh, where I started my um, professional uh, academic career uh, decades ago, uh, and delighted to see old friends while here and um, pursue intellectual projects uh, I began with them. Uh, this is also my third time speaking at a federalism, um, Federalist Society um, student symposium. The first was while I was here at UVA. Uh, and I had the simple message that um, being a feminist and being a member of the Federalist Society were not at all incompatible. Indeed, every member of the Federalist Society should be a feminist. At my second uh, student symposium, uh, the subject was originalism, I again had a very simple message. Uh, being an originalist in the United States, given its constitutional history, and being a feminist were incompatible with one another. And therefore, no self-respecting uh, feminist should be uh, an originalist. Somewhat more complicated message uh, for you all today, um, and I'm going to begin with the, the the new, not the revisiting part uh, of my remarks. And I'm going to structure the first part of them around a concept I'm uh, working on, uh, which I term the new feudalism. And by that, I mean that what our rights are in the United States, what we are entitled to, is becoming more and more, rather than less and less, a function of our hierarchical attachments with respect to our employer, our state, our church, uh, our family. And as with feudalism, we have a choice of who those hierarchical attachments are in the first instance, uh, or at least many of us do. Uh, you know, we can choose a state, we can choose a church, um, we can, uh, unless when we are ch young children, choose a family. Um, but once that choice is made, more and more rather than less and less uh, follow from it. I mean, you use the example of the Affordable Care Act to uh, illustrate this, but I could use uh, other uh, examples. Uh, what I'm calling the new feudalism might also, however, be called, and this gets to the topic of this panel, the new domestic relations. Uh, those of you who remember the old domestic relations will recall that not only husband and wife and parent and child, but also master and servant, master and slave in the southern United States, uh, were among the domestic uh, relations. And there's a sense in which we are re-domesticating the master-servant relationship uh, in cases like Hobby Lobby, but it also in cases um, uh, like um, the Quinn, Harris v. Quinn case uh, involving uh, the uh, union um, participation of people whom the state pays to care for their uh, own uh, family members. Uh, but coming back to the, uh, the example uh, of the Affordable Care Act, um, and one of the interesting things about it for me is the feudal character of the claims uh, of the employers, uh, for example, of the, of the family corporation uh, Hobby Lobby. Um, they're not just closely held, but they are uh, a family uh, corporation, and they have a paternalistic view uh, of what God requires of them and what they're called uh, upon by God uh, to give uh, their uh, employees. Um, relevant to uh, all of this discussion is the uh, title, although not the rest of the particular content, of a book by Brad Wilcox called Soft Patriarchs and New Men. Uh, it should be no surprise to you that I'm against patriarchy, whether soft or hard, and I see patriarchy coming back uh, in a lot uh, of these arguments. So uh, taking uh, the Affordable Care Act, my, uh, in scare quotes, favorite uh, Affordable Care Act uh, case uh, is uh, one brought by um, a man named Paul Wieland, who is a, a legislator in uh, Missouri, um, and who uh, claims uh, that um, because his uh, adult <coughs> daughters are now, through the Affordable Care Act, entitled to uh, insurance through him and his employer uh, until they are uh, the age of 26, uh, he stands in the same relationship uh, to his daughters as Hobby Lobby does to its employees, and therefore he should be able to uh, deny his daughters, uh, through his insurance plan, uh, contraception. Uh, and he's litigating uh, this claim. Uh, I think this is problematic for a number of reasons. I'm going to reference some of them. First, again, this uh, hierarchical um, paternalistic um, 
feudalization uh, of, the, uh, of the insurance claim, uh, all with um, references to familialization. Uh, another uh, example of this familialization is um, Notre Dame, who says in its cert petition in its own uh, Affordable Care Act case, quote, that just as a Mormon might refuse to hire a caterer that insisted on serving alcohol to its wedding guests, or a Jew might refuse to hire a caterer that determined to serve pork at his son's bar mitzvah, it violates Notre Dame's religious beliefs to hire or maintain a relationship with any third party that will provide contraceptive coverage to its plan beneficiaries." Unquote. So I don't think that plan beneficiaries are even like the wedding guests, close friends, but certainly not by, like family members. They are employees and students, and this refamilialization uh, I think is not uh, a healthy uh, development, especially since it's hierarchical uh, refamilialization. The family has become uh, more libertarian in its legal structure, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to see this refamilialization move away from uh, the, the libertarian move. But coming back to, to, to the Whelans, um, I think it's, a, it's not a very good thing for, uh, on any theory, uh, that um, insurance becomes available to adult children uh, through their parents' plans. Not only does it open uh, up conscience problems such as that of Paul Wieland uh, and claims uh, such as his, uh, but it also uh, violates the, the Billy Holiday principle, God bless the child that's got his own. Uh, it seems to me that um, whether one has insurance should not be a function of uh, who one's parents are and who their, their employers are, certainly not uh, when one is already oneself uh, a, an adult. Uh, and the reasons why uh, the American system is structured in this bizarre way uh, get back to things that I would think that members of the Federalist Society, especially its libertarian members, would not uh, be in favor of. I mean, the reason why employers provide insurance is largely a, an end run around uh, wage controls uh, in uh, the middle of the 20th century, in the era of, uh, of the New Deal uh, and, and World War II. Um, and uh, again, not, it seems to me, uh, a, a good idea. So where do I think uh, one should be going? I, I now then uh, revisit uh, another uh, a project that I began with uh, my then colleague Paul Mahoney, who I think I see sitting uh, in the audience here, uh, on comparison of the role of the state in marriage and the corporation. Um, and uh, have been pursuing for the last 20 years many uh, analogies um, between uh, these two. I want to pursue a, a somewhat different one here, which is that in, we, we see in cases, again, like Hobby Lobby, but also like Citizens United, uh, that the conservative uh, movement, including the conservative Supreme Court in the United States, is finding the corporate form of less and less determinative relevance. Um, Justice Rehnquist uh, thought that the corporate form and the corporation as a creature of the state uh, really made a difference to how corporations ought to be treated. Justice Alito in Hobby Lobby uh, thinks uh, quite the opposite. I think that we, it would behoove us to carry over this view uh, of the corporation and the more general view of the law with respect to the corporation, which is that, unless I am mistaken, uh, the law by and large is indifferent to how people organize their business affairs. They can choose to incorporate uh, or become a partnership or a limited liability corporation or a franchise operation or structure their economic transactions as a series of uh, one-off contracts as they see fit uh, without the law really stepping in to um, uh, express much of a preference. I think we would be a lot better off if we applied that view to the organization of domestic relations. And I invoke here um, my uh, more recent and uh, unfortunately recently deceased colleague Ronald Coase. Uh, whose theory of the firm basically said that uh, it, the circumstances, including legal circumstances, um, incentivized people to structure their uh, relations uh, one way or another, but there were a variety of different ways, either as a firm or not a firm, uh, to structure uh, one's relations. 
uh, I think we should have the same approach to domestic relations, that there should be uh, more viable options for, uh, for domestic relations, uh, not just a uh, fetishization uh, of marriage, and in particular not a fetishization of marriage uh, as the gold standard. Um, those of us who are lawyers should realize that law is the world of the second best. I don't want to get involved in a debate about whether marriage is or should be the gold standard for domestic relations. I will say that the function of the law is to deal with things that are not the best. It's what the second best should be. And um, those of you, who, and, and, and I think I also will be appealing to the libertarian half of the Federalist Society when I say a libertarian approach to organizing domestic relations, uh, again, facilitative on the part of the law rather than directive and moralistic on the part of the law, uh, would be uh, an improvement. And I think that uh, part of the problem uh, with the same-sex marriage movement it is, is that it has done more than anything else uh, to reinscribe marriage uh, as the gold standard and to uh, abort what were in the mid-90s when Paul and I started thinking about these issues, uh, nascent movements to uh, facilitate other forms of legal organization uh, for uh, family life. And I regret that uh, we are no longer in the mindset of uh, Justice Denise Johnson of the uh, Vermont um, Supreme Court, who in one of the earliest of the same-sex marriage decisions said, uh, I think descriptively at that point, absolutely correctly, the following. This case concerns the secular licensing of marriage. The state's interest in licensing marriage is regulatory in nature. The regulatory purpose of the licensing scheme is to create public records for the orderly allocation of benefits and position of obligations and distribution of property through inheritance. Thus, a marriage license merely asks acts as a trigger for state-conferred benefits. In granting a marriage license, the state is not espousing certain morals, lifestyles, or relationships, but only identifying those persons entitled to the benefits of the marital status. I think it would behoove us to return to that sort of approach rather than the dignitarian approach uh, of, say, Justice Kennedy. Um, and having these, uh, a variety of facilitative relationships uh, would, I think, do uh, well uh, with respect to uh, addressing poverty. I commend, um, Brad Wilcox mentioned uh, um, several uh, studies and books about comparing uh, different states. Let me commend another one to your attention, and that is uh, Naomi Kahn and June Carbone's Red Families and Blue Families. And one of the things she, they point out in this book uh, is that if we look at the difference between the uh, ideologies and the success rates in those states that vote blue and those states that vote red, uh, the blue families, uh, are, which are the families that have more of a variety of family formation, uh, as we heard from Kate Heimowitz, uh, lower uh, divorce rates, later marriage, um, are doing, by and large, better, not only uh, living their own ideology, but on the terms that the red families uh, would uh, like to uh, themselves uh, have. Uh, whereas in uh, a lot of the South, there is early marriage, early divorce. So um, in terms of uh, prescriptive um, programs, not only do I say we should be more facilitative with family forms, but we should have less and less depend from the perspective of government on uh, who your familial attachments are. So uh, Brad Wilcox said we should be not, do nothing to disincentive marriage. I think we're doing too much to incentivize marriage. That is to say, uh, again, I think insurance benefits should be uh, individually and, and not family-based. I think the social security system is already doing far too much uh, to reward people in marital relationships as opposed to in caring relationships or based on their own um, uh, contributions to the system or their own needs. Um, and uh, I also think that um, education, uh, focusing uh, on, uh, again, the facilitative rather than marriage promotion and um, uh, abstinence-only education, uh, as the Red Families and Blue Families book suggests, uh, works better and should uh, more readily uh, be endorsed. Uh, so. I'm generally arguing uh, on the libertarian half against the social uh, conservative half uh, of family formation and organization. I think the Moynihan Report uh, was uh, not uh, a, a good description of what the problems uh, with the inner city uh, African-American uh, family 
are, and instead we should be facilitating, if necessary, strong single parent families. Uh, but in any event, facilitating a uh, variety of family formation uh, and choice uh, rather than a model which, uh, however gold, is never going to be the one size that fits all. Good morning. I uh, find that I have to eliminate all my lawyer jokes since my granddaughter is here as my guest and she's a first year student at Richmond Law School, so. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, uh, approach the topic from the perspective of what I call a radical pragmatist. 80% of my closest friends are ex something. It's because I have worked most of my professional life um, in an organization I founded 34 years ago called the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. And prior to that, I was involved in the civil rights movement. And then in the 60s, I got mugged by reality and came to the American Enterprise Institute. <laughs> um, and I came there to work with Peter Berger um, and Bob Nesbitt. And they were working on the whole project mediating structures, looking at what is the role of intermediary institutions and they asked me to come in residence at AEI to write about these uh, subjects from the perspective of a practitioner, someone who is on the front lines dealing in low-income neighborhoods with solutions. Um, and I left the civil rights movement in the 60s, late 60s, when I realized that a lot of poor blacks were the victims of a bait-and-switch game where we generalize about all the conditions of blacks, and then when the remedies arrive, it only helps those at the top who are well-educated. And I'm finding the same perspective as we look at the whole issue of poverty. You cannot generalize about poor people. I, I identified four categories of poor people. They're people who are poor because they're broke. They don't have money. But their character's intact. And then you got category two, people whose character's intact, but there are perverse incentives for them to achieve in giving our welfare system. And so they conclude that it is not worth it. And so, um, and then you have category uh, three, people who are disabled, and, they're, and they sh we have to find a way of helping them. But even in the disabled population, you have people in Appalachia or discouraging their children to read because they'll lose $600 SSI check. So we need to do something to fix that as well. But category four uh, is what concerns most of us. Those that are people who are, uh, who are poor because of the chances that they take and the choices that they make, there are character deficits among that population. Those are the people that if we give money and services to them, it injures them with the helping hand. The problem is people on the left look at all poor people as if they're all category one, and people on the right look at poor as if they're all category four, and therefore the remedies, we miss each other when we're talking about remedies. Um, and, uh, and, and the people in category one and two use the system the way it was intended, as an ambulance service, not a transportation system, as a bridge over troubled times. They get it and they move off. But category four, it becomes disabling to apply the same remedies. But it's also true that it was not until the 1960s that we associated poverty and pathology. As it was stated, uh, the, the, the black community is often a moral barometer of the health of the nation. Yet in, in 10 years of the Depression, when we had a negative GNP, when we had a 25% unemployment rate, the unemployment rate in the black community was 40%. The marriage rate in the black community was higher than it was in the white community during the time of, of, of the Depression, during economic de uh, deprivation. And when racism was an integral part of our legal structure. And so those families continued until 1962, 85% of all black families had a man and a woman raising children. 
But this decline occurred in the 60s, and uh, I think uh, uh, Fred Siegel's book um, it, uh, is very telling. The future once happened here from Manhattan Institute, where he talks about liberal social uh, activists at the time concluded that one of the ways that we can reveal the, the, the moral shortcomings of capitalism is flood the system with welfare recipients and so that goes. So what we did was we detached work from income. And, and it was assumed that if we detach work from income, men would be diminished, the role of fathers would be diminished, there'd be an increase in welfare dependency, there would be drug addiction with school dropouts. And these, these, are some, these policies with Clara Piven and others uh, were followed by government action to re actually recruit people into the welfare system. So the stigma of welfare was changed from social insurance to uh, uh, welfare rights, and the case of blacks to reparations. And, uh, and, and in there, you can, and so that, that's what happened, and that's when this cliff, the black family and the other families began to fall off this cliff. And then you saw out of wedlock births is, and then poverty. And so the question that I, that I want to address that I don't hear too much is what are the solutions? When I read Putnam, when I read Charles Murray, when I read Larry Mead and all those other scholars, they are long on analysis of the problem, but short when it comes to solutions. And so I would like to offer what I believe solutions. The word. The, the reason that we have the word enterprise in our name is because we believe that the principles that operate in our market economy should operate in our social economy. In our market economy, it's driven by uh, uh, entrepreneurship. We recognize that only 3% of the people in our, in our market economy are entrepreneurs, and, but yet they generate 70% of the jobs. This is where all the imagination occurs. The iPhone, is 60% uh, 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 of Apple's income came from a product that didn't exist for six years ago. Because what drives our market economy is imagination, is innovation. But in our social economy, it is just inverse. What drives uh, in our social economy, you can waste millions if it's well managed by well credentialed people because we assume that certification is synonymous with qualification, and so our experts are those who study the, the, the folks and not those who produce outcomes. In our market economy, 70% of all our pharmaceutical discoveries comes from untutored sources, the rainforests of Brazil, the, the monks in Tibet, who engage in meatless activity that produce results and then smart people come along and see what these unsmart people do. And then we take their inventions and we market them, bring them here and we market them. That's why the drug racer pine in the 50s was some uh, uh, researchers from Vineland, New Jersey went to Tibet and saw that the monks were using some herbs to cool people out after they go into a, a religious frenzy. And that's the foundation of our sedatives. Our, and so, uh, so that it is a common practice in our market economy to learn from untutored sources, a source of new knowledge. And so what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, we recognize that, as we do in a commercial economy, that, that most of the entrepreneurs in our commercial economy are C students, not A students. A students come back to this university and teach C students in Dow. <laughs> Because a lot of smart people have to have all the answers before they act, and when they act, the opportunity is gone. C students are able to act in the presence of their doubts and uncertainties and are willing to fail and try again. And so what I, uh, what, let me tell you how this applies to what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. We go into low-income neighborhoods. We do not do failure studies. You can learn nothing by studying the failures of people except how to create failure. So 70% of the families in these low-income neighborhoods are raising children that are dropping out of school or in jail and drugs. It means 30% are not. Why don't we go into those 30% of the households that are functioning and find out what is the source 
of, of, of the knowledge and experience there that is causing people to succeed and achieve in the midst of these toxic communities. But we don't do that. So what we do at the center is we go in there and we try to find out what is the source. We found, for instance, and then we try to apply miracle Grow in the terms of training and technical assistance. So we act as venture capitalists but, uh, by going in and applying not only a, a resources, but also information that enables them to take what works among the 30% and apply it to the 70% that is dysfunctioning. And what we have found, for instance, in 73 in Washington, D.C., we worked with a group of residents in public housing uh, in Kenilworth Park, saw a drug, in fact, typical public housing. But some, a lady there, Kimmy Gray, age 25, abandoned by her husband, divorced at 25 with five kids, got off welfare in three years, and sent all five of her kids to college. And then she used her energy to take over the resident management of that property, organize the residents. They formed a resident corporation where they were uh, applying these, these principles. In the course of 12 years, 570 kids from there went to college. Welfare dependency went down. Uh, and, and uh, 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 strengths were uh, emerging on these people. And as a consequence, we studied that. And, and then uh, Jack Kemp uh, helped us, had some hearings there, where we came in and did positive uh, hearings about what works. And this was reported. We got the rules changed so that the residents could have the money that the housing authority was receiving so they could hire other residents. Well, dr dr drops in welfare dependency, teen pregnancy was, was, was dramatically reduced because people had hope inspired by indigenous leadership. And the same thing happened in Cochrane in public uh, housing. Uh, the 60 Minutes worked three months with us, investigated that, and they did a 26-minute study, a uh, uh, show on resident managed public housing, reporting all the very things that I'm telling you now. So there have been dramatic islands of excellence that defies the, 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 the norm. But it's interesting, not a single researcher, left or right of center, ever took the time to come and find out why that was working, how it was working, and what are the implications for public policy. 60 Minutes could do it, PBS did a special on it, but not a single researcher. And, and, so what my, and so what I'm suggesting is that if we want to know what works to reduce poverty in America, let's go into these islands of excellence that have been created by the people living there, try to find out what is it that they have done that defies conventional wisdom. And then let's have some, some conferences and studies where we bring the people who are successful. We fill our conferences not with people that have failed, but uh, people that have succeeded. And we put microphones and research in front of them to try to tell us what works. What are the lessons that can be learned from people suffering the problem, rather than always studying failure? Uh, George Menard Shaw asked the question, the rhetorical question, must a Christ die in torment in every age to save those that lack imagination. And Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. What we are lacking, ladies and gentlemen, in our uh, search for solutions is, is not just tinkering with the economic incentives by pr providing work requirements, drug testing for the people, with both the left and the right tried to, we have to understand that it is cultural change. And, and contrary to what Murray in his book, he says that uh, we believe that the upper classes of Belmont have a moral obligation to offer examples and instructions of success in order to lead the working classes and the poor out of the wasteland of failure. Well, all is not well in Belmont, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley, among the families living there, where the suicide rate among teenagers is five and six times the national average. Their income, median income is $200,000. 97% of those families have two parents in there, and the kids are jumping in front of freight trains, jumping off of bridges in record numbers, 
And the same thing is happening in Plano, Texas. Uh, heroin addiction deaths are occurring in, in, in New Hampshire and in Northern Virginia. So all is not well in Belmont. And perhaps if some of the remedies to, to isolation and loneliness uh, if, we, if the solutions that occur in these toxic neighborhoods, perhaps there's something that low-income people can offer people in the upper class in Belmont, rather than always looking to, we, we, we assume that, that the solutions are always external, but perhaps we need to look for some new sources for a solution, and I contend, look among the broken if you want to be healed. Thank you. I can't resist. You know, Charles Murray, who is, uh, I admire, uh, 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 acknowledges the criticism that Mr. Woodson made that he doesn't uh, give remedies. And do you know what his reply to that criticism is? He said, libertarians don't do solutions. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to open it up to questions. There's a program, the program that follows this starts immediately after we're finished at uh, 1045. Um, but we'll, we'll take questions. But before we do that, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, the panelists whether they, any of them wish to comment on the presentation of uh, any of their colleagues. <laughs> Professor Wilcox. Yeah, I wanted to say three quick things about Professor Case's remarks. Um, <laughs> you know, I think fundamentally my view is that her view overlooks the sociological function of law. Um, you know, the idea here, of course, is the law is not simply a regulatory mechanism for um, freely choosing adults. It's also a teacher and a guide for the society at large. And that when family law de-emphasizes marriage, you get less marriage. Um, and as Amy Wax, who I think is here today, has pointed out, what ends up happening is the most disadvantaged Americans, the ones who are most affected by the deregulation of marriage and family law. And, you know, well, so what? Obviously, I've, I've given you some facts and figures. I'm, I'm obviously a conservative, but I wanted to quote here from someone who is not a conservative, uh, John Gruber, who got a lot of grief for his role in Obamacare. But he did an empirical piece on divorce um, and kids and says in, in his research, I find that unilateral divorce regulations do significantly increase the incidence of divorce. I also find that adults who were exposed to unilateral divorce regulations as children are less well-educated and have lower family incomes. And he goes on from there. But his point simply is that empirically, it's a matter of fact that shifts in family law had an impact on kids and their future well-being. Um, in this case, you know, the deregulation of marriage um, had some pretty negative impacts. The final thing I want to mention is just that Professor Case is not correct when it comes to the relationship between political culture and family stability. Um, I've done three pieces over the, the last year looking more carefully at the empirical claims by Naomi Khan and um, June Carbone in their book on red versus blue families. And they argue that blue states have stronger families. Um, and they are also sort of argue that blue families tend to do better. The problem with their argument is it's, it's just not correct. We, we actually find the data is the reddest states and the bluest states. So again, states like Utah and Idaho on the one hand, or Nebraska on the one hand, and states like um, you know, Minnesota and Massachusetts on the other hand actually have the strongest uh, families in America. And if you look at the county level, it's actually even clearer that the reddest counties tend to have the most marriage, the least non-marital childbearing, and the most intact families, which is one of the key outcomes that Con and Carbone look at. So, and then in terms of unpacking that, it looks like both culture and education matter in ways um, that I suggested in my talk today. And the educational argument, I think, is consistent with Kahn and Carbone's argument. But the cultural argument, that is, that when you kind of control for things like race in the South um, and education, um, what you find is that the most conservative counties are the ones that have the most marriage and the most family stability and the least number of kids in single-parent families. So the point I'm making here simply is that this argument about red states being weaker on the family is not correct. There's a lot more nuance there, and I think we need to be attentive to the role that, um, that marriage actually plays in the real world here. Okay. Okay. Can I just say something very quick in response, which is, um, I think what you've just said um, makes rather than refutes my point. I'm not arguing that we should, in a sort of totalitarian way, impose um, 
blue, for want of a better word, family culture on the nation. I'm arguing for the availability of alternatives. And I think one way to put it is in terms of the food metaphors that are so popular in this area. Um, you mentioned applesauce. Uh, Justice Ginsburg at, at the DOMA argument mentioned skim milk marriages. Applesauce and skim milk are nutritious. Some of us like applesauce and skim milk. Um, whole milk marriages are great for those people who like them and are not lactose intolerant, but some of us would like skim milk or even soy milk um, as our family diet. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I would um, like to challenge the idea that um, we haven't facilitated alternative family forms. That's exactly what started happening in the 70s, uh, actually even in the 60s. Um, and if you look at some of the decisions made by the Supreme Court in uh, the late 60s and going into the 70s, uh, many of those decisions uh, related to um, what, what was called at the time illegitimacy. Um, those decisions basically did away with the idea that there was anything different about uh, the children of married uh, parents and uh, the children uh, who from um, uh, uh, what we what was called broken families now there are there are in in those decisions there were good reasons to uh, reach conclusions that uh, uh, that in, in the specific cases uh, but the wholesale rejection of the idea that marriage had any uh, uh, privileged uh, form was, I think, um, very much opening this door to the kind of thing that Professor Case has suggested here. Also, all of the decisions on um, no-fault divorce, again, uh, uh, did exactly what uh, she's calling for. Uh, and the results are what I described earlier in my remarks when, uh, when we started. Uh, so that I don't, I, to do more of that, it seems to me, uh, is just to keep uh, chasing our tails. Um, I, you know, finally want to do a little riff on the uh, Trotsky uh, comment before, which is that, you know, you can make the state so that it's not interested in single parent families, but single parent families are going to be interested in the state. Yeah. Mr. Woodson, please. Um, well, we'll take a question from you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Everett, and I go to school at UVA, yay us. Um, and my question actually is to the entire panel. Now, I'm from the People's Republic of Seattle, and, uh, eh, well, have to be from somewhere, right? Uh, and I grew up in what Charles Murray would call um, a Belmont community. And, but by and large, even though people, by and large, most of the people I grew up with, while they're not out there plugging the institution of marriage, I didn't see, I, didn't, I don't recall a single family in my neighborhood that wasn't married or wasn't I mean, in effect married if they like, didn't own property together and everything else, even if they weren't legally married. And so I'm curious uh, and to ask the entire panel, how do you feel, as Charles Murray and others noted, where you have, I mean, people who by and large still like they always have been, have been getting married in the upper, in the upper classes, but yet aren't advocating for marriage as an institution? Yeah, that is, I think, we have a sort of curious situation where there are a lot of folks who talk left and walk right um, in the upper class in America. And on the one, it's a kind of curiosity, but I think it's where it's, I think, more concerning is that when it comes to questions about law, when it comes to questions about popular culture, when it comes to questions about education, sort of the power of marriage as a, as a mechanism for stabilizing family life and increasing the welfare of kids is not being broadly communicated or reinforced in the larger society. So I think the problem here in part is that not only are they not, as Charles Murray would say, they're not, they're not preaching what they're actually living out. That's part of the problem, but also they're, they're not kind of at the broader society level reinforcing the importance of marriage in ways that would, I think, redound to the benefit of working class and poor Americans. Just a quick response. Um, I commend a book to you, Richard Watts, Fables, uh, Fables of Fortune, What Rich People Have That You Don't Want. <laughs> 
read that and it is sequel to that is the children of entitlement. All is not well in Belmont. Yeah. I, I just want to make one comment and it's uh, I'm reminded by something that Kay said that, that, that a college educated men tend to marry college education, educated women and that was not always the case in this country. And what has happened, uh, some social scientists say, is, and this is causing a, a greater divide between the upper third and the lower third, is that our communities have now become more homogeneous. It used to be that there were rich people and there were poor people and they went to the same school and they got to know each other. And somebody once said that, the, that uh, what was it, that the uh, people who marry tend to know each other. It was a joke. Uh, <laughs> And the way they get to know each other is because they're in communities that are mixed. And, you know, I live in Bethesda, Potomac, Maryland. There are no poor kids in Potomac, Maryland, no poor kids in Bethesda. They go to the high schools, they all go to college, and that's who they know, and that's who they tend to marry. Yeah, do you, okay. Get to your point. Um, you know, I want to take issue a little bit with uh, Charles Murray's idea here. I. You know, I think it, you do want to talk about um, the way that you found the good life and pass it on to your children and, you know, and, and make it a communal discussion. However, uh, I don't think we can deny these are very difficult conversations to have. We now have communities that uh, for many generations have, you know, have, we have children who have never met a married couple. Uh, and you cannot, yeah. you know, simply expect that the people from Belmont are going to be able to come in and, and tell them how they did it. So I do think these have to be community-oriented um, solutions if we can find them. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not saying people of Belmont shouldn't uh, support those communities and shouldn't uh, 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 give advice to them. But I, I think we really have to recognize that this is very tricky stuff. And you have children who have grown up in circumstances that we're asking them to put behind them. OK, let's go to the uh, next question. Thank you. Kathleen Knutson. I'm a 3L at Regent Law. Thank you all for coming. It's been a very informative panel. I have a two-part question that leads off of last night's panel. Last night. Members of the panel discussed how the only true equality is equality of rights before the law, but not equality of opportunity or outcome. Is that something that you would agree with? And if so, what does that mean towards incentivizing marriage? Is the incentivizing of marriage a way to make people unequal before the law in the interest of public policy? Um, I think it should be obvious that I think yes from, from what I have said. That is to say, um, you know, the way in which we have piled on benefits to marriage um, and to the people um, within marriage, um, I think, as, as Paula Edelbrick said uh, way back in, in the early part of the uh, same-sex marriage debates, has not been a good thing. For uh, and come back to children, right? Uh, equality under the law um, is hard to see with respect to children whose rights are dependent on again whether they have parents with an employer with an insurance policy. Uh, that seems to me not a uh, rational basis for distinguishing between the rights of some children uh, and other children uh, under the law. Uh, question is whether it's possible to really make the distinction that you're making because yes, uh, maybe there are benefits that have been piled on for um, for married couples, there are many, many benefits that have been piled on, uh, perhaps not through the law, but through policy uh, for single parent families. So, um, you know, where, where are we really talking about, when we're talking about rights of individuals, we're talking um, in a very abstract way that doesn't get to what we've, um, uh, you know, the sociology, as, as Brad said before. And I think the broader point that I would make here is one that Bill Galston, who's speaking here I think later today, has made um, in his writings on liberalism. I think we often forget that our 
American experiment that our liberal institutions actually depend upon non-liberal institutions, or it's that kids are more likely to thrive and to be responsible citizens, uh, to be successfully engaged in the labor force, for instance, um, when they are raised um, in a thick, and this goes to Robert Woodson's point, I think today about the meeting institutions, when they are raised in sort of a thick matrix of institutions, including intact families, you know, secular civic institutions, religious civic institutions, they're often organized along non-liberal lines. And this is also a very Tocquevillian point as well. So we have to be attentive to the way in which, paradoxically, successful liberalism, and this is something that libertarians tend to overlook, depends upon uh, flourishing non-liberal institutions, including families. I do believe that you have the equality of opportunity. I think Don and Rachel Warren did a study in low-income neighborhoods, and they asked people where do they turn to in times of crisis and in trouble. The first seven institutions were institutions within the same zip code. And in light of that reality, we tend to deliver services to the institution of last choice, a professional service provider. So the lower the income of the person, the more they rely on these intermediary institutions. And so to strengthen them often come, uh, uh, produces a, a, a surrogate parenting for a lot of these kids. Okay, we'll take the next question. Good morning, Joseph Dressman, uh, Southern Methodist. Um, I'd like to make two quick comments, uh, two questions, and I'll take my seat so I can take notes on your answers. Uh, first, Mr. Woodson, I just have to uh, really commend a lot of your comments. Um, this idea that, um, specifically Marxist idea, that it is power and economic power that is the sort of first principle of happiness is, is as, as you say, just uh, completely false by, by the fact that it is, in fact, the wealthy who uh, so often are suffering. And um, I would, I would also point out that the 20th century, which is supposed to be this pinnacle of progress, is in fact the most bloodiest, the most violent, the most evil. Uh, even in the case of, of women, well, for why example, don't you get to your skyrocketing <laughs> rates of depression. Uh, Ms. Sankase, you said that the law should settle for only ever the second best, but you seem to think that feminism is best. Do you therefore say that we should settle for patriarchy, or would you force feminism on us patriarchically? Thank you. I did not say that the law should settle for the second best. I said that the realm of the law is the realm of the second best. That is to say, the law deals with problems, not with ideal states. And um, what the ideal state is, is an interesting debate to have, but neither, uh, certainly not sufficient, maybe not even necessary, to the question of what legal um, frameworks and solutions there should be. You bring to mind you probably don't know who Eric Severide was, but we remember him. He, he was a news reporter, and one of his, uh, one of my favorite lines was, Eric Severide said once that the main cause of problems is solutions. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Catherine yeah. Boyles from Duke Law School. Um, my question is primarily for Professor Case, um, and I was wondering, you referenced how um, the kind of marriage between employers and the healthcare system have created this kind of quasi-feudal state. Do you see any way to disentangle that bizarre marriage? I mean, I think, you know, path dependency has led us in a worse and worse direction with every step. And I think, you know, the, I, I would have much preferred something closer to a single payer. Um, and I, I think that in, in the ACA case, um, I would have been happier if the court had come to, if it was going to strike down part of the Affordable Care Act, I would have rather that it struck down uh, the employer mandate and left the Medicaid um, option in place uh, rather than uh, vice versa. So I think it's, it's a series of path-dependent legislative choices that have uh, pushed us in this direction. And how to improve legislative function, I think, is something that everybody in this room wishes we had a solution for. I certainly don't. I wish I did. Yes, sir. Uh, morning, uh, Victor Razzi, uh, 3L at University of Texas. Uh, Professor Wood, uh, Professor Wilcox, and Mr. Woodson, you both mentioned that uh, the sustained high rates of marriage during the Great Depression uh, sort of cast into doubt a causal link between poverty and and uh, decline of marriage. Uh, but doesn't the experience of the Great Depression then also cast similar doubt on a link between 
uh, receiving public assistance and and uh, you know a decline of marriage. I just I'm wondering if we can't if, if we have to accept both sides of this as opposed to just one. I think uh, the difference, uh, and I, I agree with you like with with marriage, but also what we did was in the '60s there was um, moral deregulation accompanied by policies that reinforced those, uh, those relationships. So you had economic forces uh, supporting and buttressing cultural forces. Uh, so that's it. Even, it's interesting because the, the, the so-called bourgeois two-parent household was defined as racist by the black power movement. And the feminist movement also, because of its patriotic, they were all against it too. So you had a, a, a combined, even some of the leading scholars like Kenneth Clark came out and, and talked about the bourgeois family. To have that as an expectation for black America was racist. So you had those, it, so it was a combination of economic forces reinforcing cultural shifts. The, the point is this, the family has always been more fragile among less educated and lower income Americans. But the fragility has been much more accentuated in, in the post-60s era. That's the point. And this is a point, too, that Amy Wax has made in her, her work on this question. So I'm not saying that economics doesn't matter. I'm just saying that what, it really matters a lot more in a world where family law is weaker, where our civic institutions are weaker, and where the culture does less to reinforce the norm of the intact marriage as a sort of the family ideal. And in that context, these, these sort of economic disparities become a lot more salient, and that's what we see today in terms of this sort of growing family inequality in America. Uh, can I just add one more thing, which is that I, I doubt that anybody at this table is against, to, against um, uh, uh, welfare uh, dependency when there are really difficult times, and we all believe in a safety net. The Depression is a perfect example of when we do need public support. It's not only at the table, it's up here. You know, you've got to include Excuse me? me too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and you too. So, so let's make that distinction. And you know, the recession. I, you know, I assume that most of us, or all of us, believe there had to be extra help. So, and that that in and of itself doesn't have to lead to long-term dependency. No. Yes, sir. Uh, Gavin Phelps, Notre Dame Law School, 3L. Um, how I want to ask the entire panel. Has government's involvement in marriage made it better? Is it necessary? And can two people enter into a private arrangement and still have a loving and committed family? So I am of the view that government involvement in something like marriage is descriptively necessary. I mean, I, 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 I don't aspire to be married. I don't think marriage should be the gold standard. I don't think we should invest it with uh, moral significance. But I think that there is a role for government in marriage. And because I'm at the University of Chicago, I, I'm contractually obligated to use the word efficiency once in every talk I give. Um, <laughs> the reason why um, the government should be involved uh, in providing the option of an institution like marriage is because it is efficient. That is to say, marriage is an easy way for people uh, to point uh, over at one another as a default matter, only as a default matter, as the default person for everything from um, healthcare decisions to inheritance, um, you know, even though you can uh, choose your uh, sister the doctor as your healthcare proxy and your brother the lawyer as the holder of your power of attorney, people tend to choose their spouses. This, by the way, is a reason uh, why we can stop it too and not move down the road to polygamy if we wish to resist polygamy, because two is the efficient number. They point over at one another. With more than two, you're already in the realm of contract and, and variety, and there isn't the same reason for the state to be involved offering a, an off-the-rack solution, just like the state offers corporate status. Both marriage and corporate status were infused with moral significance far more in the 18th century than now. And I think it is a good thing that both of them have become what my colleagues Easterbrook and Fischel would consider a network of contracts today, rather than something for the favorites of the state for enumerated worthy purposes only. have a loving relationship, long-term relationship without being married. Of course it's possible, uh, and it does happen. 
Um, we, you know, when you're making policy, though, you have to go by what the data shows. And what we know um, is that in the United States, at any rate, and this is not necessarily true in other countries, um, people who are not married, who are simply cohabiting, are far more likely to break up um, and, and earlier than uh, married couples. So, for instance, a child who's born to cohabiting parents uh, has three times chance of seeing them break up by the time they reach their fifth birthday than the child born to married parents. So something about marriage in this country in particular uh, seems to assure more stability for kids. And I think the broader sociological point here, again, is that in every domain of our lives, we have institutions that govern and guide us, that give us some sense of sort of order, how we order things and how we get certain things done. I think the sort of the naive assumption in many today in our society is that we can organize one big domain of our life, that is family life, without a clear institution that would govern that in a way that's apparent kind of at the society and communal level. So for instance, I, in my class on Wednesday, I call up the State Farm Insurance Agent to give my students a sense of what the discount is for men who are 23 years old when it comes to owning a 2012 Honda Accord. There's a $315 discount that married guys get on their car insurance. And that's just because, you know, State Farm knows that there's something about marriage, the institution of marriage, that's linked to more responsibility on the part of driving uh, for 23-year-old guys. So it's just, it's an institution that, that governs us in a variety of ways, and including for men, sort of how they, you know, go about driving around town. So it's, we tend to lose that sort of sociological insight into marriage. But we, you wouldn't have it about law, you know, do you need to go to your law school to get, you know, to be an attorney? Well, you don't need to, but of course the institution, hopefully, the law school is doing a lot of things for you that makes it more than a piece of paper after three years. Yes. Yeah, um, Carolyn Cook, 3L at the University of Chicago. Uh, my question is probably more for those on the panel that subscribe to Professor Wilcox's view of the sociological role of the law um, in getting at solutions to these problems that so many of you highlighted. I'm wondering um, if some of the proposed solutions getting at tax structure and no-fault divorce would are really going to be enough to save marriage um, without addressing the cultural shift behind the devaluing of marriage and family. And a lot of us reference the 60s today. I'm thinking of the deteriorated effects of the sexual revolution, which have become manifested and the uh, constitutional rights of abortion and contraception and how uh, conservatives who want to reverse these effects, what options are available uh, as far as solutions for changing the culture behind the devaluing of marriage. Well, I, you know, I certainly would say, and I think it's important to acknowledge here, that what happens in Washington, D.C. and in Sacramento and Richmond, um, among other places, Springfield, Illinois, is much less important. Um, than what happens in West LA, I think, when it comes to American family life. And I'm, I'm serious, and if I, if I could just influence one city, it'd be LA, not DC, but um, I don't have <laughs> a line of access to LA. So I, I do think we need to think about ways in which we can foster a more family-friendly popular culture, and that's, that's a, a big challenge. Yeah, I, I, I um, you know, I'm pessimistic, quite honestly, um, and I, um, however, I plan to go down <laughs> fighting. I, um, you know, I think that uh, we've tried marriage promotion programs. Um, I think the results were disappointing uh, to uh, those who supported it and uh, would, would admit that as well. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I would, I would offer this one little piece of hope, which is that uh, we have seen a dramatic decline in teen pregnancy since 1991. And that was largely caused by a cultural shift. That is, there was an almost universal agreement uh, that came about because of a lot of problems throughout the 70s and 80s, that it wasn't a good idea to have a child when you were 15 years old. Uh, and that consensus had, not, had dimmed, had, uh, had been uh, modif modified in those earlier decades. That consensus changed kids' behaviors. So I, I always come back to them and think, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't laws, it wasn't, um, it wasn't even necessarily programs. It was a, a, um, a, a shared consensus, and that's what we need. Okay, we have uh, two more minutes, and I've been told that now uh, after this session ends, there will be a 10-minute break before the uh, debate begins. But you're our last uh, uh, questioner, and so we'll have to make it brief, okay? I will do my best. My name is Melina Sieber. I'm with the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Um, as a follow-up, really, to the last question, Professor Cates 
Case, you mentioned that law often deals in the second best, which would seem to imply that there is a best. And as law students and future lawyers, we deal in one realm. But is it even possible to change this without dealing with the reality that we need to deal with that there's a reason why two works in a contract, especially a marital contract, the best, and it's morality. And if we aren't willing to deal with the reality that there is a moral judgment that needs to be enveloped in our law, how can we ever pray to solve these problems? Thank you. So, I mean, my view is the reason the two work best is efficiency, not morality. Um, and uh, I, I think you chose the word pray advisedly. Um, I do not propose to pray to solve these problems. I propose to uh, strategize, research, um, you know, do the things of this world to solve the problems uh, of this world. I will say that our founders made it clear that it was not the structure of our system, capitalism, democracy, it's the values that we pour into those structures that, enable, that defines who we are and what we are. So morality, yes, is critical uh, to the definition. That's what I, the virtues of our founders is what really drives and supports this, this republic. But those are values that we pour into our institutions, including our families. I can't resist the, 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 the fact of the matter is that all law is based on, if, if you dig deep enough on moral questions, and even the idea of autonomy is itself a moral value. So what you're doing is, cha or, or is choosing one over the other, and the question is why and on what basis. Can I just follow up and say, um, I'll come back again to analogies between marriage and the corporation. Think about divorce and bankruptcy. It used to be the case that bankruptcy was deeply infused with moral fault. And to be a bankrupt was to be disgraced, and bankruptcy was to be discouraged. Similarly, with respect to divorce, we have now substituted in both areas the idea of the fresh start. The idea that the important thing is to take resources, monetary resources in both cases, personal resources in both cases, and put them as quickly as possible to their, uh, their best possible use. I don't think anyone is lamenting the disappearance of morality from the law of bankruptcy. And I wonder whether we wouldn't do well to feel the same way about the disappearance of a heavy dose of same shame shame sanctions in the law uh, of divorce, which is one way that morality um, would manifest itself. That is to say, you are a moral failure if you've had a marriage that's failed or a business that's failed. Okay, I think, I, think we've got to, I think we've got to cut it off now. Let's have a hand for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.